because it's 430. So we've got a couple people coming on yet. If we can just hold her up a tad. That would be great. Frank and well, for well, I guess for all of you folks, as soon as council approves nominations, um, your nominees are now members of those commissions. And then they swear in when they are able to, second meeting of council, when we can get them there. But uh, so that means that Scott and Gary's up to full membership, and Scott Osterholm and Brian Raguski are alternates, and they can come on and be members of the quorum or whatever needs to happen here. Okay, so Brianne, this, right. this is your thing, right? All do we, right. Do we need to, like, we need to call, let Frank call do this. Okay, oh, right, okay we got so, officially open. So welcome everybody to the uh, special work session of the Planning Commission here on February 28th, 2022. And so now I guess, uh, turn it to Brianne, you're gonna give a presentation on uh, what it is we're, we're working to understand with respect to ORC and our zoning code, right? Sure. Um, Judy, right. I'm gonna share my screen here. I've got a very brief PowerPoint, but um, you all got a 41 page memo that was mostly case law on the 15th. Um, my portion was, fairly limited, but the situation we find ourselves in is that our zoning code, all right, slide, it's not what we need to start the slideshow, not now, from beginning. All right, so planning commission of course has the authority under the revised code as the planning commission as well. Planning equals planning in the minds of many, many people. So um, under section 64 of the charter, you've also got pl uh, platting duties in addition to your zoning building codes, the map, um, all the powers granted to you by the revised code, as well as any ordinances the village of Yellow Springs has adopted. And under section 1276.02 of the codified ordinances, before a zoning application is approved, you have to make an affirmative finding that specific provisions of controlling sections of the code have been met or exceeded. Now, again, that's with respect to your zoning code, not your platting code. And the issue is your planning, platting is very distinct from zoning. So, you know, I'm lo looking at basically what's a screenshot of if you go on AM Legal, this is, this is what comes up. You've got, you know, planning commission, this section here just basically says we have alternates. Um, the open space program, right of way vacation procedures, and then here's the the pickle we find ourselves in 1226 is the subdivision regulations. And that is what currently is has an inherent conflict with ORC. Um, and then of course, under title four, we've got all the zoning. Now, why are we here? Well, I'm gonna dial all the way back to 1990. Plats are subdivision. It's a means of conveying land, setting boundaries, making a map, the platting, statutes are not a substitute for your zoning. Huh. But back in 2019, we get West Alaska versus Broadview Heights and the Supreme Court said, as far as the platting deadlines go, there is a 30 day deadline in the revised code that city and village planning commissions have to follow. And it prevails over any longer deadline provided for in our subdivision regs because under the home rule, Platting is not a function of local government as much as it's a police power. And what the police power means, I sent that when Scott asked about what is police power? It means the things that people are gonna be expecting as consistent in terms of um, things that are regulated for health, safety, and welfare. So your planning commission cannot by rule or regulation extend the review time for a plat beyond 30 days. And here's the kicker, without agreement of the plat applicant. Okay, and that's what's in the revised code. We'll break down the language in the next few slides. But if the planning commission fails to act on a plat within 30 days under the revised code, it's deemed approved. So why, why are we here? No plat shall be recorded. And this is why it's also a police power that needs conformity statewide. 
plats have to be recorded with the county. So it's not just a plat that we get and we say it's it's the village, it's in house, it lives forever with us. It also has to go through review by the county engineer tax map and the county recorder for consistency with revised code and all the regulations the county has to follow. So again, no plat shall be recorded until the village signs off on it. Now B2 governs plats and unincorporated areas. We're not gonna get into that. Now, this is what was litigated in the Wesolowski case, 71109C. We have to endorse on the plat within 30 days after the submission or within such further time as the applying party may agree to. So my proposed solution is just, we ask every applicant to agree that because planning commission has regular meetings, we don't meet on call the way the BZA does, that every applicant understands the planning commission has the authority to do preliminary approval on these plats. In other communities, they've got a full zoning staff where preliminary is all signed off on by an administration official or the planning commission meets on the call. If they get an application, then, then they meet just like our BZA does. But that's, that's what I would recommend is that we change our language to make it more consistent with the revised code that an applying party will agree that this is the procedure we follow. That's an interim because I'll get into what's down the road here in a few minutes. Now, again, if the planning commission fails to take action within that 30 day time period, they have the right to demand a certificate saying that the planning commission failed to take action. And it's the applicant the does. And we have the applicant does. Yeah, the applicant has the right to demand it if we haven't right. acted by the deadline and they haven't agreed to extend the deadline. Now, the other uh, question that has come up is what about changes that take effect while the process is pending? So what about, you know, planning commission approves a preliminary plat, the code changes, the plat's not consistent. What does planning commission do when it comes time for consideration of the final plat? Well, what you have to go by is whatever's in effect at the time the plat was submitted. So that's what the revised code says on that point. Now, if you deny any plats, you have to specify what rules violated. And our subdivision regs is very clear. We review plats for zoning consistency, and that is perfectly appropriate. We are not proposing that we change that in any way, shape, or form. We are just talking about the deadlines here. So now, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry, Brian. Could so that thing says the grounds of refusal or approval. Mm -hmm. So do we have to indicate why we approve something? Yes. Yeah. I mean, when we go through our subdivision regs and we say this, uh, we, we can go through 1226 as far as like the criteria for approval, as far as what a plat has to have on it. You go, yes, it's met this. Yes, it's met this. No, it hasn't met this. Bring it back because you can do that. You can say, we're denying it. Bring it back until you have this. And that's okay, for, perfectly reasonable. For, for, and, and this is based on our, the Village of Yellow Springs plat regulations. Subdivision that, regulations. 1226. Yes. yes, but we okay. have to specifically reference in the application process and make, a, make it a matter of record which subdivision regulation we're, ref we're referring to, whether it's approved or denied. Okay. okay. Now, again, if it's denied within 60 days, the applicant can file into common police court and say their subdivision regulations are not reasonable. Here's why. And if they do that, the planning commission is joined as a defendant. Now, we have to basically give a copy of the subdivision regulation when we're sued in a civil action. So as far as defense goes, if we say it's based on this, um, this is why we can cite our subdivision regulations when we're talking about approval or rejection. We can cite our zoning code when we talk about approval or rejection. But the comprehensive plan is a little bit trickier because to the extent the comprehensive plan is codified, it's part of the zoning code. But the comprehensive plan update in October of 2020 was not itself a change to the codified ordinances 
saying these are all the new zoning districts, et cetera, et cetera. They were more of a general aspiration for how development's gonna go in the village. So you've got your comprehensive plan up here. It's an umbrella, it's a general aspiration. It supports your future zoning code um, and your zoning code is what a developer is expects to be enforced. Um, and and, and I, it, it is codified, so <laughs> sure. Lisa? So I feel um, some kind of way, stupid or something, um, because for me, I mean, I was overwhelmed by that H memo of case law. Um, and this is also very dense. I, I'm not an attorney and I'm striving to understand this. And so for me, this doesn't quite get to why we are here. So just in, in very simple terms, just to help me wrap my head around it, um, could we just, uh, and maybe everyone else is, is on top of this, but what I don't understand is like, why, why are we here right now talking about this now? Is this something new? Or did we discover something that, um, you know, you just stumbled, uh, I shouldn't say stumbled, but happened upon a realization that we had a disconnect or why are we here right now talking okay. about this? What, what I will summarize of why, why are we here right now? In 2019, your solicitor should have, should have advised you of the Wesolowski case. Home rule does not apply to subdivision regulations. That's the takeaway from the Wesolowski case. In 2021, which I will get to in a few seconds, there was a second district case. And four days after that case came down from the second district, I advised planning commission, this case has applied Wesolowski in the second district, which we are part of. So we need to update our subdivision regulations to conform to the revised code. That's why we're here. Now, the other part Thank of you. why why we are here is, again, we can only enforce the subdivision regulations that are in effect at the time an application is brought. We anticipate subdivision applications coming to us. So that's why we need, again, I said something a year ago, but we, we need to act so that those regulations can be in effect when we get the applications. Got it. That's really helpful. Thank you. Maybe others weren't as close to it a year ago and that was helpful for them too. I hope so. Okay. So again, Thank you. <laughs> if it goes to court, um, you know, the, the plaintiff's burden of proof is a preponderance of the evidence. It's the lowest burden of proof just means more evidence than not. Uh, you'll hear some attorneys call it the 51% rule. I don't like to call it that because burden of proof is not a numeric standard, but it is the lowest burden of proof in a court of law. And so this and is the so, case I was referring to that so, came down in February of and, 2021. Um, and, RL hold on. a question, Brianne. So, so if the if somebody appeals this to the a judge, the common pleas judge, and they um, they're saying that uh, we're not properly, I guess the, what they could say is that we're not following our own rules. Then the the judge is um, is going to make a decision on this if they mm -hmm. if they amend their plat let's say we you know we don't like their plat for some reason and then they amend it uh it doesn't come back then if they appeal it to a judge they can amend it and bring it to the judge and the judge then decides whether it meets our rules they don't resubmit to uh the planning commission for approval well amendment would not be something for a judge to consider now, I thought, if, I thought it said we, in there that they could change yeah, their plan. If we deny it, if yeah. we deny it and they say, oh. well, that, you know, and we cite the rule that we deny it under yeah. and say it's the deadline um, because they didn't, they didn't submit it 25 days in advance or 20 days in advance or whatever the case may be. And they say, you know, that rule is not consistent with revised code. We're going to take it to court we basically have to admit that our subdivision regulations are not in compliance with ORC on that point. Okay, but it, 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 the talk in that 
uh, in the previous slide about amending the um, that that has to do. I mean, so let's yeah, say there's we... something substantive that they don't meet that is in our rules, and then they change yeah. it. If, uh, if they if they say yes, we'll amend that. Yeah. That is basically one of two things. They're either agreeing that yes, we're extending the time frame in order to amend it as required, or we're saying we're denying it, bring it back. And it's like a completely, I mean, the the application process is such that we wouldn't be asking them to necessarily pay additional fee, but we're saying right now it's conditionally denied because of X. Okay. Bring it back. And once you have X, then it would be ripe for approval. Okay. I guess I'm not understanding that whole appeal process where they go to a judge. They have 60 days to go to a judge. If we then, reject it. If we yeah, reject or we it. Do, or we don't. They have 60 days to go to a judge if we reject it. Okay. And then, and then the judge could approve it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it, based on uh, the application of our uh planning and zoning rules yes okay and again so, the planning and zoning rules that are in effect at the time the application is submitted okay so i feel like so, Stephen is asking you i i don't i feel like you guys are asking and answering yeah. things and here here's what i'm getting from the confusion is Stephen. to me i guess what i'm hearing is you're you're maybe conflating two separate things because they're sitting really closely together. One is the issue of how much time do you get before you have to hear it and make a decision? That's one issue that's kind of in the forefront because if planning commission fails to act in a certain amount of time, then it's deemed approved. Mm -hmm. right. that's, one, that's one leg of this business. Mm -hmm. The other is that planning commission takes action, you're reviewing it, you're doing your job, and you say, oh, heck no, you, you're not following our code with regard to setbacks in this plat at all. So we are going to deny it based on that. Um, and, and in that case, plan, planning commission is completely in the right. If they want to appeal it, they can, but, that, but you will have cited the reason for denial the reason is set out very clearly in our planning and zoning code, and they would in all likelihood lose that appeal. So there's two separate chunks. Yeah. Is yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So I just, I know that we're not, we're the, the issue that brought this up was the timing, but I just, I was just yeah, curious yeah. about how that works with uh, the appeal to a judge and how much authority a judge would have uh, to, um, you know, to bring in their own interpretations to our codes. Yeah, um, what, I, what I wanted to check to, the, the second case you're talking about, uh, a different scenario mm -hmm. is let's say, let's say we, the planning commission rejected, um, you know, a proposal, you know, a, a subdivision or whatever, but the applicant didn't agree with our basis for rejecting it. Th their view was the code says it's okay, and you rejected it anyway. That would be a scenario that they would go to a court, go to a judge, mm -hmm. and the judge would look at our look at our our code, and say that our rejection was not was proper was not proper relative to our code, and that would would then go override our objection and approve. That's that second a different case of that second case second scenario you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. So again, the the Troy case, um, Troy was set up like we are. They've got a preliminary and a final plat approval process. And their code specifically let them take up to a year to make a decision. Well, oh, oh. <laughs> that's maybe on 30 days. And they argued because, um, you know, they, they knew the West Lusky case was out there, but they said it shouldn't apply to a preliminary plat consideration. And the second district said it doesn't distinguish it. Plat is a plat. So um, they actually applied uh, 71110, which all has almost identical language and said, uh, your, all of your steps in the process from preliminary to final shouldn't take more than 30 days unless the applicant agrees to it. 
And that is problematic, not just from our standpoint, but for other communities that have the same kind of tiered process. So we're just basically asking applicants to agree because our village code requires preliminary plats to be submitted 25 days before the regular planning commission meeting and presuming the plats approved at that meeting. 122604 requires final plats to be submitted 20 days before regular planning commission meeting. And then planning commission has 30 days from that hearing to issue the recommendation to council. And then council has another 30 days to act on planning commission's recommendation on a final plat. So your minimum timeline, just based on the advertising for a preliminary and a final, you know, uh, imagine those two things back to back. Your minimum timeline is 45 days, not 30. Um, but then your likely average timeline, anticipating that an applicant does agree to extension and we get all the advertising done and there are suggestions uh, for modifications as there can be. Um, you're looking at an, a likely average of 105 days. So again, the only out under revised code 71109C is extension of the deadline within such further time as the applying party agrees to. So we're basically asking to include in our subdivision regulations that every applicant agrees when they file for a preliminary plat that planning commission is the body and it meets regularly. So they're agreeing to this timeline for the process. And if they don't, well, we're probably going to face an action for a declaratory judgment saying our code conflicts with 71109. So there, there isn't, what, there isn't a, a provision to have like a special session or what, what would you do in the case that somebody so someone who agree? doesn't agree? Yeah, we yeah. would have to set up a special meeting. Okay. And, and would that special meeting in and of itself violate our own rules? Not necessarily. We've had special meetings before. Um, as long as it's properly noticed, I mean, then planning commission can act. Okay. So I have a question about that, though. I don't see how we can legislate that someone has to sign a thing that says we can basically supersede ORC when we're not permitted to supersede ORC. We can put it on an administrative form and then we will know whether we have a green light or we don't have a green light, but I don't see how we can possibly legislate that it being in and of itself a, a, a violation of the ORC. Well, again, that's that's our out under the ORC is if they agree to it, we're good. So we're, we're basically but saying so we're going to ask why, everyone to agree to it. So why can that not just be done administratively on the form that Denise gives anyone who applies for a subdivision? Because th this is the other the other issue with um, you know, subdivision regulations. Denise has to follow what's in the subdivision regulations as the administrative official. That's her function. So when she does something and gives an applicant a form and says, you have to get it back by X deadline, BZA actually is the body that's charged with any, you know, hearing any appeals from either her actions or planning commission's actions. So if someone goes to BZA and says, she didn't warn me, and I couldn't tell from reading your regulations that I had to do this, then we've also got a problem because your regulations are supposed to put everyone on notice as to what is expected. I have a question. Um, it's related to the letter for today's meeting forwarded to us by Judy at 12.07 PM from Sarah Sinclair Amend, where she suggests addressing this in by adding it to 122602. Um, what, what is thought about that suggestion, please? Well, again, in, in terms of no plat will be accepted for the Village of Yellow Springs review until necessary reviews have been taken by the Ohio Department of Transportation 
pursuant to state laws relating to state rights of way, including compliance to the basic provisions in ORC 71109. Section C of 1226.02 only applies to subdivisions off of state routes. Denise and I have discussed that your ODOT reviews don't apply to most of the subdivision regulations within the village because we have one state, well, we have two state routes, 68 and 343. So adding it to that section is inappropriate because again, we are, we are trying to put people on notice that this is what we are expecting. Right, so it wouldn't be added under C in that case, it would be D. But, but it is submission and action on preliminary plat. So it, it would feasibly fit in that section. And that's, and that's where I propose to put the language. In a new section D? Yes. And um, I believe actually we added like a sentence to section B. Denise, do you have that document? I, I do. I, I didn't have it pulled up. Well, I do if you want it. Yeah. I can stop share, Judy, if you want to put it up. Was that the While document? From that our... up, let me just say yeah. thank yeah. you for clarifying that. Uh, Part C part. I really appreciate it. It is becoming more clear. So thank you for your patience. So that's what we've proposed. That our 30 day clock actually starts running the day that, <laughs> I mean, it. it Again, it, this is one of those subject to interpretations questions. What is the date of submission? Well, is it the day Denise gets it? Under a lay person's definition, absolutely it would be. But the village can't act on it the day Denise gets it. The first date we could act on it would be the date of the planning commission meeting. If we and again, uh, planning commission can only act at a duly noticed public meeting. So, and, you know, so the the date of their application becomes the planning commission meeting, and if we change the rules before we get to their uh, application, because that's the date of uh, submission, then the new rule applies. No, the new rule would not apply. It would apply to the rule in effect at the time you get the application. So. So, okay, say that, you know, legislation <laughs> takes effect before your planning commission meeting. Okay. Denise has done her review, but something has changed. In the meantime, yeah. she has to get a report to you in advance of that planning commission meeting, correct? Okay. <laughs> so, so you operate the, by, by what's in effect on the date of submission. Using I mean, this I data, understand where you're coming from, where submission, theoretically so, so council have could act, it would two take submission, the day before two submission dates. the submission date. Okay. I can't imagine this being a problem very often, but okay. Yeah, I don't, I, I think it could. I, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, it, usually planning commissions take care of plats, but completely, I mean, don't have their council involved in it, and but we do. So but it's strange that I almost wish it was done at council at the preliminary plat level rather than the final plat. I'm not sure why they why you wait because if planning commission approves it at the preliminary, then you've had this developer is putting all their money into doing all the engineering and the, the drawings and taking care of the survey and putting together all that other stuff and then it goes to final and it will go before council. So my guess, my question is, does that, I mean, council could deny it at that level after it had already, if nothing had changed from what was the preliminary? I guess that's my question. If, if the yeah, preliminary council, plat is- council has, it, council has the ability to approve or deny, but 
again, if it does, as far as litigation is concerned, it needs to say what the, just like planning commission does because council has final action and platting is a administrative function rather than a legislative function. They have to specify why they are denying it. Uh, I, hate yeah, I, to, I hate to get really radical here, but I mean, we're changing this and I know that no one will like this at all, but I do not understand why if it's considered a police power, this goes to council at all. And if it didn't go to council at all, this problem would be just about eliminated. It would be because we would be able to meet the deadline. I don't understand it. I mean, if we're saying this is a police power, that's like saying that if I'm enforcing the height of your grass uh, through the police department, it has to go to council before I can issue a citation. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't make sense. So that's that's not radical, Judy. That's how some wouldn't handle go it. that route of just eliminating the council role here. And it's a big, big deal, obviously, uh, philosophically, but in terms of what most communities do, it's, it's what most communities do is it goes through commission, period. Now, again, for any rezoning, council would still have that. That is absolutely legislative. Uh, but again, the, the, the big distinction to draw is between subdivision regulations and platting which is more concerned with, again, the division of land and all the technical things that go with it versus your zoning and your land use. They're right, related. So that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah. I guess it seems like if, so if we are following the, you know, the, the zoning and planning regulations, there, there wouldn't really be any grounds for council to deny something that the planning commission had approved. But if for some reason there was some interpretation or, um, some suspicion that somebody had done something un unethical, it does give the village council the opportunity to, you know, give it a, a double check. Uh, that seems like a, a, a reasonable thing in some cases. Yeah. Well, and again, part of the function of the planning commission is to be that technical advisory body for council. But, but, but uh, whatever it was, it would only go to council if it was approved. If something's rejected by planning commission, does it still go to council? No. Nope. No, yeah. So Steve's scenario only comes into play if, 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 if planning commission approves something that's shaky. Right. Yeah, okay. Well, wait, if, if, wait a minute, that's not true though. I mean, it, with the preliminary, okay, with the preliminary, it doesn't go to council anyway. It's when, but with the final, um, your recommendation would be to deny it. I would think it would still go to council. And the, because and, we're making, are we, are we making a recommendation to approve, modify or deny to council or are we not making it as a recommendation? Planning Commission makes a recommendation to council under the so, structure currently for final plats. So my answer would be yes, it would, okay. final would still go to council, but I, that's not what Brianne's saying. So I guess we need to sort that out um, because I would think we would just send it on to council and say, Planning Commission okay. denies this based on this. And so if we take that one step further and then council accepts it, I, I, I'm confused. We'll pull up, um, I think it's the 1226.04, which is action on the final plats. Okay, so Brian, is, is, is that this is specifically for planning, you know, this whole thing about mm -hmm. it goes to council regardless. There's, I, I'm not gonna give an example, but there's other things that planning commission reviews, uh, make it very generic. There's other things that planning commission reviews that if we reject something, it doesn't necessarily go to council. It's only in perhaps that one case, maybe there's others. Well, I, again, the, the subdivision regulations is what the, the case law recommendation was based on, but planning commission's function is very broad under the charter and under the ORC. So 
I mean, in terms of, you know, things that get reviewed by council, all of your legislative recommendations on rezoning, all of your recommendations for revisions to the code itself to go to council to adopt or not. Um, you know, in terms of platting though, that that is the one that historically council didn't have much in the way of a function in other communities, in other villages. It was almost exclusively left to the planning commission as a body. And I can get other communities to compare with if you want, but it, it's entirely up to you whether you want me to do that research or not. So, but, so, can, but, go ahead, Judy. Well, so again, there's that thing about the difference between police power and legislative function. And I, to me, we're, cause I, I operate in both groups where council tends to get in trouble, just, just in trouble, is the tension between what you can choose to do as uh, an elected official and what you can do when you are on a quasi-judicial board. Now, if you hand this to council, they also have to act in a quasi-judicial manner at this point because it's considered a police power and they don't do that. That is not how they think in general. It's very difficult to have that group of people say, but wait, wait, we don't, we don't like this. We want different things. Well, planning commission is saying, yeah, we, uh, us too, but you know what? It meets code and therefore it should be approved. But if, then once you hand it off to council, that's to me, I see more uh, room to have lawsuits happen and us to lose anyway, um, then we should probably be contemplating. I, it just seems like a big risk when that's, really all they can do is rubber stamp what planning commission has given them. I, I don't see them being able to do anything else. So if I'm missing what they are able to add to or make better what planning commission has done, that would be important to know because otherwise I don't know why that we take this risky extra step. Yeah. Um, again, the, the thing for planning commission and council to keep in mind is plats are administrative and zoning is legislative. And while the two are related, if, if this proposed revision, which again, it's a band-aid, I will fully admit it's a band-aid to try to get the agreement of the applicants and not shake up our process radically. But if planning commission is of the mind that we need to overhaul this process entirely, planning commission can propose that to council, but it's up to council to then enact legislation to overhaul the process and take itself out of the plat consideration. Okay, so really the, the thing that's driving all of this is this 30 day thing. And your solution mm -hmm. is to put in there that we, we basically, we don't start the clock for 30 days until they're in the planning commission meeting. Yeah, that the 25 days beforehand, we're not starting the clock there. We're saying the first okay. day the planning commission can act is when we're gonna, we're, we're gonna consider that the date of submission because, you know, say they submit it 25 days and Denise is doing her report and finds something that is missing just missing entirely. And on that basis would be a grounds for denial. Right. Well, part of the reason we have in there that preliminary plats shall be as the result of as many meetings as the applicant needs is so that that kind of thing can be avoided. But we have some, we, we have some workarounds for doing that to where it's the, it's the, it's the day of submission is the day that is the first day that planning commission can act on it because okay. if the developer says, oh, you know, we forgot to get a stamp from a survey or something like that, but everything else is technically accurate, but this one thing is missing. And again, you look at all the standards for approval, there's a laundry list. They're all technical. Um, most of them are not, it's a yes or no. It's not something that is like zoning to where 
um, you know, you've got subjective considerations. It's for sub, for the subdivision stuff. It's it's yes or no. So so um, so this is dealing with that one issue, and it, it, we're we're giving the also the possibility that somebody doesn't agree to that, and then we would have to deal with that. Yeah, uh, if someone and, doesn't agree, then our alternative is to schedule special meetings. And the um, this thing about citing the reasons why we're going to approve or deny something was that in there before? Or is that new? That is straight from the revised code. That is language from seven eleven oh nine that we are putting in. So to, that's, to, a, that's to, ba new. to basically say that you know, this new. is not this is not for the developer. This is for us. To say okay. that when we act on something, we we know that we have to make a record of why we are acting the way we are acting. And then the third thing is, so we could we could revisit this whole process of whether the council needs to be involved and how this thing works. When when you allude to the idea of that this is a band aid, are you thinking about r revising the whole process, or when does this not become a band aid? Yeah. It, <laughs> Um, when a court tells you that you're done, <laughs> um, okay. from my perspective, this is because amending the subdivision regs involves planning commission, it involves council, it involves the community, but your subdivision regulations need to be focused on the health, safety, welfare. Again, the police powers, your utilities, water, sewer, stormwater, all of the infrastructure considerations while your zoning is concerned with you know, the land use. So it, it's a community conversation that needs to happen. It's not me driving the bus. Again, this is just more of a, here's the case law that has come down and this is the proposed fix to comply with the case law while the community through planning commission and council reassesses you know, some communities have what they call a unified development ordinance. It has their subdivision regs and their zoning in it. Um, other communities go by form-based zoning. Uh, right now, we have a zoning code that from 2013 was the last major overhaul of it. And there have been proposals for, this gets me back to my PowerPoint. <laughs> there have been proposals for, um, yeah, you know, doing more pursuant okay. to our comp plan. And, so, and the, uh, you know, and this, how does the comprehensive the, plan fit with our zoning and our subdivision regs? And, and so this 30 day thing is the, they obviously have uh, anticipated that 30 days might not be enough. And they've given the written into this, the code, the Ohio code that you could get people to agree to a longer mm -hmm. time frame. Because 30 days seems like a, a very short amount of time for the way we're doing things and to get the input that's that's needed. Okay. I would agree. All right. And the other thing, so this our comprehensive land use plan, this thing that was just recently passed, when it references the the land use plan or in it does it's referencing something earlier. There's a different plan, an older plan. Yeah, but the the current plan, the 2020 update is incorporated based on the ordinance that was passed in October of 2020. Oh, okay. So, so, so the, it's the, to it, includes, it includes the land that was formerly in the township. It includes the 52 acres. Mm -hmm. okay. It's, okay. It's mentioned so in I, there. I don't know if people caught it. I mean, it's mentioned as um, on the, there, that there's a piece of land on the east side off of Xenia. It's it, that area. And then the map shows it. Um, right. which was considered the South transitional area, but it was meant for different uh, densities. Okay. Okay. I thought it would also be helpful to see as far as like distinguishing our definitions versus revised code definitions, you know, Ohio revised code goes very simple on plat and we're more detailed. And then on subdivision, they're more detailed, we're more simplified. But again, what, what, we're, confer what we're concerned with this afternoon is the subdivision regulations and the definitions are essentially the same, even though one's got more language. Anything that's dividing a tract of land into two or more lots for development or transfer of ownership is a subdivision. That includes replats. So um, your, again, your major difference between your subdivision regs 
planning function. It's administrative. Some communities call it ministerial, and it predates zoning because you know, you've had subdivision regs in Ohio since 1923, uh, but zoning, of course, took off after the Euclid case, and it's in Ohio, by and large, based on use. And you've got your Euclidean zoning challenges, which we have Euclidean zoning. Um, the premise is that your different types of land uses are incompatible, which as comp plan consultant noted, leads to sprawl, segregation, and supply issues. So how does our comp plan fit? It inventories the conditions, it outlines the vision for the future, it describes action steps, and we enacted our, our latest version of the comp plan by ordinance 2020-23, but the codification included reference to it. It did not operate as a rezoning. In fact, the implementation recommendation said we need to undertake a development code audit to promote infill, um, to look at the zoning requirements that add costs um, and support you know, our missing middle. So that language is verbatim from the comp plan, those three bullet points right there. So, so something, if somebody wanted to, to put in a plat and it was not something that was like uh, in the comprehensive land use plans uh, vision of things, it's, it, we wouldn't have any reason to deny it based on that. Not on the comp plan, but what's the current zoning? That would be my okay. question. Okay. So... So, um, if I go to, you know, the contents of your preliminary plats, you have to look at, you know, these things, you know, and it does, it does include, you know, what is the existing zoning? So again, you got your name, location, names and addresses of owners, the dates of the surveys, um, showing the boundary lines, locations, widths, names of all existing platted streets and alleys, utilities. Uh, and the zoning classification of the tract and the adjoining properties and the description of the proposed zoning changes, if any. So as far as, um, you know, again, basis for approval or denial, it's what does it contain and the action on it as far as, you know, what, what do you need to see that it's got everything here that's listed? So I have a question. When, when this goes to council as a final plat, is it accepted by council or voted on by council by resolution or by ordinance? If it's not, a, it's, it's, since it's not a rezoning. It, well, that's the thing. It, <laughs> it, preliminary plat is supposed to indicate whether or not they want rezoning. And we had this discussion because a PUD is also a plat. Okay, so you're well, basically you know, submitting it, it at rezoning. the same time. Yeah. So. Rezoning, zoning itself is a legislative action. And that means that it's subject to referendum. I would say that your actions on plats can be done by resolution because they are administrative. However, you've got right here, the recommendation to approve, approve with conditions or disapprove will be provided to council within 30 days and the village council will hold a public hearing within 30 days of receiving the recommendation and take action. So it doesn't say whether it has to be done by ordinance or resolution, but again, because- But we typically do it by ordinance, don't we? Because, I mean, yeah, because yeah. It's, it's been done before by ordinance, that would be, and because of the public hearing, I would say that's the way to go. Now, yeah. again, the issue is gonna be when it comes to a plat, the case law in Ohio is that a plat that does that complies with existing zoning is not subject to referendum. Say that again. Wait a minute. A plat is administrative in nature, whether you approve or deny it, 
therefore the let the legislative action of a council to approve or deny a plat is not actually legislative it's administrative therefore it's not subject to referendum hmm. so does that so it could be done by resolution So that's that not how we typically do it. I mean, no, that, has a, that that's not how it's been done in the past. <clears throat> so, I mean, that's my question. Does that supersede charter? You can't. The, the case law that it is administrative and not legislative, yes. Then why again is it going to council? <laughs> I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand that because to me, that is the process that council undertakes and the public has the right to bring referendum against a piece of legislation. Mm -hmm. So now you're hitting them on two fronts, as opposed to if we just take council out of the loop, at least you're not presenting a fiction to the public that says by charter, you have the right of referendum on any ordinance, even an emergency ordinance. Oh, but not this one because ORC. I mean, I, to me, it's a, it's a, to me, it's a better, cleaner process to take council out of that loop because they've been, uh, uh, well, emasculated. Use the word of your choice at this point. Anyway, they don't, they don't have their legislative power. I don't understand it. I mean, but, I mean, I guess whatever. But I just think we're going to be shooting down all kinds of challenges the whole way along because it seems wrong to bring a process that people are accustomed to being able to bring referendum against and they, but then they're told they can't. Judy, that's a very interesting point that it, it's setting up an expectation that it isn't able to fulfill. Mm -hmm. That it, it's an administrative decision. Does it meet the rules or doesn't it? And that it really shouldn't need any other um, debate. Correct, and also council does not have police powers. They have legislat legislative power. So you're acting them to behave in a manner that they don't normally behave in, and then telling them, oh, and by the way, whatever you do, it doesn't actually matter. Because right. Right. Judy is, um I mean, it's in the planning code, but is it also in the charter that council takes action on this? I mean, so it's, if yeah. we make it, if we yeah. did amend, if we did make an amendment, a suggested amendment to council to remove council from this process, we're not having to do a charter amendment. No, no, no. Uh, -uh. I, I I'm only about the the right to bring um, referendum. Not about the subdivision stuff is completely and and wholly in the zoning code. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I can I can send you all, and I I don't want to send you another forty one page memo that's very dense cases, but I can send you all a link to the case law on, and and that that was way before the Broadview Heights case as far as referendums on plats. Um, there's ample case law in Ohio, um, and it's all elections law. Um, that if if it doesn't involve a rezoning, it is not subject to referendum. So for me, I mean, and this is the general preference in terms of helping me um, to understand these dense topics, um, putting me into case law is, is not my preference. What really helps me is interpretation by, you know, you as someone who is, a tr is trained as to be our solicitor, because I mean, maybe maybe others would would be challenged. Like if I sent them um, an an article from a medical journal or a clinical journal about a complex research study, it makes sense to me. But that's because I'm a nurse with a PhD. But my job is to synthesize for people, and so for me, synthesis of case law. Um, is so much preferable than versus just the case law itself. Well, and um, that's what that's why I tried to uh, 
uh, synthesize it in three yeah. pages instead the, of yeah. 41. This is great. The PowerPoint is great and because I just got really lost um, with that. I just, I couldn't, um, I just, I, I just am not going to read that all. I mean, I, I don't, I hope you don't think I'm just a slacker, but no. I just, I can't, it's too much for me, right? And I don't think I have a copy of this in my email. The PowerPoint? Uh-huh. No, I haven't sent the PowerPoint out yet. Oh, okay. I yeah, plan, this, to, do, I plan to do that. <laughs> but I, 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 I sent the memo out because again, that's that's the, the again, three pages of me trying to sum it up and then all the case law that the memo is based on. Thank you. So to reiterate. So, so really, Rhea, so what you're saying, other than the utility review, which I was going to explain, you're bringing this as a suggestion. But to me, the the subdivision regulations still need a deeper dive. When we did the zoning code update in 2013, I mean, I wasn't in this position, but that was the zoning code. We weren't, they didn't touch the planning code. So when we did our, when we did an update of the subdivision regulations planning code, which are in the planning code, we were only doing that for stormwater um, because of the issues that we were having as a result of changing the zoning code to allow for more infill development and uncommon lots. Um, so we didn't do that kind of a dive into what we want. I mean, how we want something to look. Um, and I just don't know how much you can regulate within the subdivision regulations, that kind of thing. Because I find these subdivision regulations totally unhelpful to me. I mean, and it will be the same to planning commission. We can analyze it based on what's in the zoning code and then that's it. I mean, there's not going to be anything else that they're going to be able to judge it on. Yeah, and, and again, that's why some communities call it, they, they, they integrate them and call it a unified development ordinance because you know, your, your, your platting function, it's supposed to have objective criteria for approval and denial. Your zoning code, you've got a lot more discretion because it's the character of the community when it comes to the land uses. Well, it was interesting. I was at a how, uh, home builders association meeting last week, and was and I asked Randy Burkett from Beaver Creek if they have anything in their preliminary plat or anything like that. And he said, basically, <clears throat> what they put in there, which was a very unusual, but they put in that all lots, all newly created lots, have to be twenty thousand square feet or more. And he goes, obviously, developers are not going to want to do that because they want to have smaller lots so they can make more money. And but so that forces them to have to do a PUD and PUD then becomes the only option. And I said, so do you put all of those sort of aesthetic types of elements into it or, you know, only this type of uh, percentage of higher percentages of open space or things like that? You know, you, we, we could, because I said, you know, we don't like vinyl siding and things like that. And he goes, you can regulate that. I mean, you could put in something like uh, not all four sides can be vinyl um, or things to that effect. But in the end, um, you just, you d he said, we just don't approve it until we like what we see. It was very different um, how they do that. So I mean, I just want to come to some point at some point in time in the future to have an idea of how we can incorporate. I mean, I, I when when staff took the Ober development into consideration for what we thought the community wanted, we looked at the comp plan and, and did and felt we had incorporated a lot of that. But in the end, it became more than that. It became like a cluster housing development with much more open space. And that, that those were things that we had 
that we could, um, as an option, um, that are that that planning commission could look at as an option uh, when they made that decision on the on the PUD. So probably need to do revamp the PUD as well. Obviously, I never liked it, um, but can we add some more things into the subdivision regulations that will guide us or does it have to all go through the PUD? I get, I mean, I mean for, for it's interesting that we don't like PUDs, we wanna avoid PUDs and yet it's the opposite in other communities, that's the only way they get what they want. Yeah. So I don't know. Well, we're, we're an outlier in the PUD requirements because we, um, we've actually, when the code was amended in 2013, our consultant was out of Michigan. And we have that provision in there that unless all these requirements, well, let, me get, let me go back to the PUD code. It, it's not typical to other communities in Ohio, but it is in other communities in Michigan. So 12, Seventy. Just general heads up, you guys. So we're past five thirty. Yeah, I saw that. Oh, okay. So um, the qualifying conditions. Um, we've got the you know they have to meet certain number of minimum criteria, but then we've also got that. Um, That they can't that they find that it can't be done under existing zoning. And that's the one that's not typical for other communities in Ohio. Okay, well, I guess since we gotta wrap this up, so are we all this I guess we just need to come back at some point to to do amendments to the PUD and to do amendments to the planning code itself. But for right now, Brianne, what you you would like, what you're suggesting is just these changes to get us in compliance with ORC 711. And well, again, as far as whether an applicant would agree they're in compliance, uh, I can't predict what an applicant would do other than to say that this would help if we make it clear these are our expectations for applicants. Because when we do that, we're on more solid footing if our subdivision regulations are challenged. Well, I, I might suggest too, there's a workshop on March 15th, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission's holding another workshop on the exact same topic. And I would encourage folks to go. I know some of our people are going. Um, and so it's Miami Valley Communications Council. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's okay. NVCC, that's okay. And Judy and Denise, uh, you also got the information about Green County Regional Planning for the yes. uh, eight, eight yes, sessions. Yes, they, they did a great job of sending that out to everybody because <laughs> we've, got, we've got it from multiple sources. <laughs> I think you got it four times. That's Thank also you. available. You've it four times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> every, every other Wednesday from six to eight. Yeah. So if you guys, and there is, for that one, we do need, um, there's the, the charge, there is a charge <clears throat> for that. So if you guys want to just think about whether that's something you might be able to do, it is in person. Um, and if so, we, I will put through a purchase order and we'll make it happen. But just pop me an email, if that's something you think you might be able to do. If not, fear not, because um, we will... Yeah. It's, it's, I think it's like $15. Oh. It's, it's most, mostly to cover lunch. It's, it's, we normally have these <clears throat> zoning round tables quarterly, and this is just an extension of that. So it's really is that the you're talking about? This is Miami Valley Communications Council. It's like from 12 to 2 or uh, on March 15th at their good. offices on Alex so Bell I'm, Road. I'm looking at the flyer, and it looks like it's in the evening. Um, oh, we're look. That's 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 um. That's the Green County uh, one. That's the Green County one. Yeah, that one I was talking um, to. So good. That one's free. So 
is what Judy's saying. You can sign up for that one on your own. But she's saying for the Miami Valley Communications Council, if That's you want to go to that one, one, let us know because we have to. We have to. I just got to look at a calendar. I, look, I think it's on a Tuesday. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yep. I just pulled it. Judy, I just pulled it up on the screen. Judy, when did you? It, it, it's not showing your PowerPoint. It's still sharing. When did you send that oh. out? Uh, this morning. All right. And I am pretty darn sure I didn't leave anybody off, but I sent you a whole, you had a flurry there going on. Um, I, I don't see it. I have the Green County one. You have the Green County. Okay. Yeah, I got the Green County. Yeah. I don't think I got anything on the Miami Valley. The one on uh, Planning Commission training generally. Uh, Right. when you did get was a flurry <laughs> the one that's yeah. on wednesdays uh, with the makeup sessions on thursday evening that's, that's the, one the one you did I get got. okay mm -hmm. let me double check in because i'm uh, maybe i sent thing to i mean i meant to send that one for sure but i also meant to send the training which i thought i sent but i'll double check so just to confirm since we're we got to wrap up um at the next planning commission meeting this will come before us uh, there'll be discussion. Brianne might present additional stuff. Is that the and then is that the next step? Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. We've got um, two conditional use hearings as well. Um, a transit guest lodging application, and then uh, Rose Pelzel's turning wants to turn her property into a farm. But no plats, right? No, no plats. No. Are we going to talk about? Street sign or street numbers, house numbers. Yes, that's on there too. Brianne's bringing that, right? Yes. It's just an okay. update. Yeah. It's it's moving a section of the code, and uh, I, I I know it's dense, but I can uh, send you a link to the to the USPS regs. Okay. Neither rain nor sleet will keep you from bringing us to our attention to this <laughs> issue. Right. Oh, yeah. I like to be able to see the addresses. How about that? <laughs> the date of our next meeting. I'm is summing it all up. <laughs> the fifteenth. Fifteenth. Still going to stick with Arabic numerals. We're not going yeah. To... So if anybody wants to go to the MVCC in the at noon, and then they'd be better prepared for the meeting. <laughs> the oh, Zoom and, meeting. And, and that's oh. also my birth. And it's also my birthday. Oh, great. <laughs> well. Um, <laughs> also, just newsflash, I'm, and I'm realizing I had a conversation with Josue this afternoon. We're dropping out of the high and elevated uh, category for transmission. So we are we're going to propose to council that all boards and commissions and council meetings go back to fully in person starting in March. Um, Without hybrid, without hybrid, without Zoom, just back back to normal because apparently everything is normal now. Um, so only two thousand people a day dying. So, so I've actually been um, focusing on this extensively today, related to my day job, and and also talking to some Ohio people just to hear what's going on, like with our big hospital system, and. Um, we have to wear masks still. We have to wear masks still. I I agree with you, Lisa. And I'm I'm we are, Judy and I were talking about uh, based on the CDC new guidelines and what the resolution that council approved for resuming the ordinance to allow a planning commission and council to continue to meet online. And it stated that once transmission rates dip below the high transmission rates, that the the ordinance is rescinded. So um, that's the challenge we're facing here administratively. We also are getting um, pressure from some citizens and past council members of uh, wanting to have all of these public meetings back in person. I, I'm glad to come back in person. I'm ready, but we we must be masked. Mm -hmm. And I understand that some people have challenges hearing, particularly more soft-spoken people than I am, who always mm -hmm. has my outdoor voice on. 
but there are also some technologies that I've been seeing um, that will feed a microphone feed right into somebody's headphones or earbuds. So if we have, for example, a council person who has a hard time hearing a masked person, that kind of technology could easily be used. I agree. I think that the, there's those things out there. One of the things I advocated with Judy is that um, planning commission in particular, because of the, of the flexibility and, and the, how it increases productivity that maybe we want to encourage council to consider an option for these volunteer uh, bodies to be able to meet uh, online because there's so many features that are available to them in a virtual environment like screen sharing, running through PowerPoints, all these things that make their work easier. I think it's something for council worth considering. So <clears throat> that's not going to apply, hopefully, to the March 15th planning commission meeting because that public hearing notice has already gone to the paper and it's and it's uh well I can advertise as virtual. <laughs> right. And I can change it till you know till tomorrow, but and, and I'm gonna have the conversation with Brian. How do we how do we um how do we transition back into in, in person meetings? We're 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 trying to stay on top of what's required of us as the administration to keep track of the transmission rates and report back to council when we've hit those those benchmarks that they've outlined in their legislation. Um, so, yeah, you know, I I think that there could be a good case made to keep the March fifteenth meeting virtual as we've already advertised it and we have presentations scheduled in that platform. Yeah. Okay, that's good. All right. But Brianna, well, if we have if we have community members attending and we're not verifying vaccination, which I think we shouldn't. Um, personally, I will not stop wearing a mask until Ohio drops to um, ten or twenty per hundred thousand. That would be for me the. Wow, that's a good and that's a good benchmark. The moderate benchmark that we're using now, it's not the it's not the lowest. No. Well, can I mean I don't know if that could be legislated differently or mm -hmm. how that could work, but um, you know, it's it's just uh, it, people's comfort level varies wildly and people's comfort level with meeting with masks on or their anger about having to wear a mask if they're going somewhere. <clears throat> As we know, we've sort of dealt with all of those variables and it would be nice to you know, have some flexibility there. Well, I, it's also somewhat ironic that the state ended its emergency, state ended authorization for remote meetings. We enacted because this is something that home rule does apply to. We enacted that as long as we continued under a state of emergency, we could continue remote meetings. And then Ohio turned around and just a few weeks ago said, everybody can meet remotely again through July because there was such a hue and cry from political subdivisions that did not have home rule that said, we, we, we just can't do it. We can't accommodate people because our meeting spaces are too small. And when we've got people talking at the podium with masks, no one can understand what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So wait, are you saying we're approved through July through the state? Mm -hmm. mm, yep. Just a matter of council making the decision for, you know, each body making their own decision in that case. Yes, no matter yeah. what decision is, it's going to be pushed back either way. <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's where we're well, at. I guess, Frank, you can bring that up to the Planning Commission then if they want to start in April. I mean, I, I actually can, it's, it's easier for me to do that behind the scenes just to kind of poll everyone. It can certainly then be a public discussion if you want it to be, but. Um, you guys aren't legislative, so you don't really have to have a public discussion on that matter. I think you can just make that determination for yourselves. Council, it's an expectation that there's some a little bit of public discussion so folks know 
what the thinking is, but for planning commission, I don't know that you need to do that unless you, you know, want to project your sentiments. So I have a question. I guess this would be for for the commissioners, all of them. If with what Judy say and Brianne said, um, what's your interest? You want to keep going and virtual into July? Yep. House Bill Fifty One goes through June thirtieth, twenty twenty two. Oh, through so. June thirtieth. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm, I I was mistaken on July, but it's June thirtieth. Hmm. I, uh, I would prefer to keep going virtual. Yeah, I, I'm happy either way. Okay, and, and it would be important for me and Denise to know that as we're, you know, we've had work that's coming before the planning commission, so we want to make sure that we're planning appropriately for, for all the commissioners. Sure. Well, I'll, I'll pull you folks, and I'll pull the BZA okay. folks. Okay. Okay. All right. Sounds great. Good. Thank you. Bye. All right. All right. Bye, okay. everyone. All right. Bye. You guys want to yeah. move to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. I'll second it. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? <laughs> <laughs> adjourn. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.